you. So priority two, strengthening climate resilience. Um, as we know, rising sea levels, more frequent intestines and ocean acidification are threatening the livelihoods and natural ecosystems of SIDS. In the Pacific, we note that countries like Tuvalu face external risk from rising sea levels, and the Caribbean is increasingly affected by stronger hurricanes. I'm not sure if much, uh, most of you would have noted Hurricane Irma um, just a few years ago, which caused a lot of catas catastrophic damage to Antigua and Barbuda in 2017. So a key um, ABAS initiative is the establishment of the SIDS Center of Excellence, which includes the SIDS Global Data Hub. This hub launched during SIDS 4 is designed to improve decision making and capacity building by providing a comprehensive data repository for SIDS. We will delve more into the SIDS Center of Excellence um, later in this presentation. Our next priority is ocean management and sustainable development. So many SIDS rely heavily on marine sources for livelihoods, food security, and economic stability. However, issues such as overfishing, pollution, and illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing present a lot of significant risk. For example, the Caribbean fisheries sector um, crucial for small economies like Grenada is being negatively impacted by IUU fishing, um, exacerbating economic vul vulnerabilities. The Abbas encourages the development of sustainable marine industries, including fisheries, marine tourism, and agriculture. The SID's sense of excellence can support the creation of marine protected areas and promote um, integrated coastal zone management. And then finally, the fourth priority is gender equality and inclusive societies. So the Abbas recognizes that gender equality and women's employment are essential for achieving economic growth and sustainable development in SIDS. For example, in the Pacific, women groups have been instrumental in leading local adaptation projects, particularly in agriculture and disaster risk management. Empowering women can lead to increased leadership roles and economic diversification, particularly in industries like renewable energy and the blue economy. Right, so now we'll just go briefly into the key challenges that SIDS face. Um, as it relates to the implementation of the Abbas. So the impacts of climate change from rising sea levels to extreme weather events, insufficient human and institutional capacity to manage projects, implement technologies, and coordinate multi-sector responses, difficulty accessing concessional finance, reliance on external markets, and limited fiscal space. Um, limited resources for data collection, analysis, and integration into policymaking, hindering evidence-based planning. So as mentioned earlier, a key Abbas initiative is the establishment of the SIDS Center of Excellence, which includes the SIDS Global Data Hub. But before we delve into the SIDS Center of Excellence, I'd like to provide a bit of context. First, let's recall the Samoa Pathway. This framework recognizes that incentives for innovation, entrepreneurship, and advancements in science and technology are essential drivers for sustainable development. To support efforts of small island developing states, the Samoa Pathway reaffirms our key commitment to strengthen the availability and accessibility of our data and statistical systems. Importantly, this commitment is rooted in our national priorities and unique circumstances. It also emphasizes the need um, for us to improve how we manage complex data systems, including geospatial platforms. To achieve this, the Samoa Pathway calls for launching new partnership initiatives or expanding existing ones. Additionally, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development highlights the urgency of enhancing capacity building support, particularly for, de for developing countries, LDCs, and SIDS. By 2020, the agenda aimed to significantly increase availability of high quality, timely, and reliable data. This includes data disaggregated by key factors such as income, gender, age, race, ethnicity, migratory status, disability, geographic location, and other characteristics that are relevant to national context. Okay. So let's now fast forward to the Center of Excellence, which has three components. A SIDS Global Data Hub, which supports decision-making through data analytics and visualization across all SIDS. 
Secondly, a technology innovation mechanism, which fosters entrepreneurship and technology transfer, offering training and mentorship for sustainable development. And the third component is an island investment forum. This is a biennial event connecting SIDS with global investors, promoting sectors like renewable energy and sustainable agriculture. So in front of us, we have a diagram of the SIDS Center of Excellence, which highlights its core pillars and focus area guiding SIDS towards achieving resilient prosperity. The SIDS Center of Excellence serves as a critical hub for SIDS offering tailored solutions to help these nations address their unique challenges. The center operates to three main pillars, as I would have mentioned, the Global Data Hub, Technology and Innovation Mechanism, and the Island Investment Forum, each playing a very critical role in supporting resilience and sustainability for SIDS. So at the core this um, of the center is the Global Data Hub, which provides enhanced data analytics and insights. And as I would have mentioned, the technology and innovation mechanism fosters entrepreneurship and access to global resources. And the third pillar is the investment, the Island Investment Forum, which creates opportunity-driven conversations around program um, investment. And at the heart of the center's effort are key focus areas, um, just to go over them briefly, climate change adaptation and mitigation, economic empowerment, um, ocean benefit and sustainability, renewable energy, statistical enhancement and training, and sustainable development practices. So now let's go into each um, component of the Center of Excellence a bit more in depth. So the SIDS Global Data Hub, okay, just making sure. The SIDS Global Data Hub is a comprehensive repository and analytics center designed to support decision-making and policy development across all SIDS. It offers technical assistance and capacity building for national monitoring and reporting aligned with the new 10-year agenda framework, the SDGs and future global development goals. Through the data hub, countries will have greater access to data at subnational, national, regional, and global levels, enhancing transparency and availability of information. Policymakers will be able to benefit from tools that allow them to visualize data, monitor SID specific initiatives, identify key interlinkages, and make more informed decisions. These capabilities will contribute directly to both sustainable, social, and economic growth across all SIDs. And lastly, the Data Hub will also be able to strengthen statistical capacity through training and data management, ensuring that statistical development um, and departments and units across all states are fully equipped to meet future challenges. Next, we'll go into the technology and innovation mechanism. So the ITM serves as a crucial platform for promoting technology transfer and innovation across all SIDS. It offers training, mentorship, and resources specifically designed to empower entrepreneurs and startups in small island developing states uh, with the goal of fostering a culture of innovation and growth. Um, the ITM will also help SIDS to build their capacity in science, technology, policy, and innovation, which are very essential for the structural transformation of our economies. Um, this capacity building will enable these countries to pursue sustainable development goals more effectively, creating lasting economic resilience. Um, furthermore, the ITM will also facilitate technology transfer across our SIDS, serving as a technology depository. Um, by working with the developed partners and tech giants, the ITM will also ensure that SIDS have access to technology that is relevant and fit for purpose. And now we go on to the Island Investment Forum. So the IIF, it is to be seen as a biannual event um, designed to highlight investment opportunities and foster dialogue among investors, entrepreneurs, and policymakers. The primary goal is to illuminate pathways for sustainable investments and collaboration while addressing the unique challenges of and needs of small island developing states. The, I, the IIF aims to continuously highlight technological and investment prospects within SIDS, ensuring that investments remain aligned with the evolving needs and demands of member states. It will respond to the changing needs, providing a platform for dialogue and investment opportunities that are both practical and future focused.
As we navigate the unique challenges um, faced by SIDS, the SIDS Center of Excellence stands a critical institution to address existing gaps and provide solutions to its three core um, components. So we'll go to each and how they can help to identify and provide solutions to some of our challenges and gaps. So first, the SIDS Global Data Hub plays a pivotal role by providing a platform for countries to share and collaborate on data collection. So as we know, many, fit, many SIDS sorry, face data gaps that hinder effective decision-making. But through this hub, we can fill those gaps and ensure that even the most resource-constrained countries have access to comprehensive data. Next, the Center of Excellence promotes innovative technologies in key areas such as renewable energy, agriculture, and disaster risk reduction. Um, by supporting the adoption of these technologies, the Center of Excellence helps SIDS to enhance food security, boost productivity, and adapt to the rapidly changing environmental conditions. So the integration of these technologies is not only vital um, for resilience, but also for driving the structural um, transformation needed to build sustainable economies in the face of climate change. Um, furthermore, the IIF, um, with the Island Investment Forum, states can access critical financial resources and technical expertise. The IIF creates opportunities for countries to attract investment uh, for infrastructure development, climate change adaptation, and capacity building. This is essentially where SIDS can connect with global investors and stakeholders to drive projects necessary for long-term resilience and prosperity. So lastly, the Center of Excellence aims to host the SIDS Debt Sustainability Service Initiative, which will provide a tailored financial, financial support to help SIDS manage their debt burdens more effectively, ensuring that financial constraints do not hinder their path to sustainable development. So I'll go briefly into the need for global SIDS debt sustainability and investment support services. So let's address a critical issue affecting all of us, and that is debt. <laughs> right. As many of you know, SIDS face unique challenges, including economic vulnerabilities, exposure to natural disasters, and the ongoing impacts of climate change. And these factors make it essential for SIDS to access sustainable financial resources to support our development and our resilience. The purpose of this service is to essentially provide a solution to the challenges by focusing on debt sustainability and strategic investments that promote resilient prosperity for SIDS. Through this service, we aim to unlock much needed financial and technical support, enabling SIDS to strengthen their economies and adapt to an ever-changing global environment. So as we look forward to the future prosperity of SIDS, the need for a comprehensive approach to debt sustainability has never been much clearer. Our vision must go beyond short-term fixes and embrace a layered strategy that creates fiscal space, allowing us to address immediate challenges while investing in long-term development. Through insurance like anticipatory response mechanisms, we can safeguard our economies against further shocks, ensuring we are protected when disaster strikes. This proactive approach is crucial to maintaining stability in the face of climate-related risk. Equally important is also investing investing in long-term resilience. By leveraging climate finance and innovative instruments such as blue and green bonds, we can channel resources towards projects that build sustainable climate resilience economies. And finally, legal advice and capacity building is very essential. With the right support, we can design investment products and negotiate debt terms that are both favorable and aligned with our development goals. So one of the key elements of the debt sustainability and investment support services is creating fiscal space to a layered approach to debt sustainability. This strategy ensures that small and developing states can manage debt while also investing in long-term growth and resilience. So we would want to focus on policy co um, coherence, ensuring that national fiscal policies align with global best practices for sustainable debt management. Stakeholder engagement as well is also a critical part of this, fostering collaboration among governments, 
financial institutions and development partners to, see, to, in, to secure investments that promote economic stability and growth. The Debt Sustainability Support Services also plays a critical role in securing the future protection of small island developing states through a series of comprehensive measures. First, we facilitate risk pooling and help assess premium structures, allowing countries to share risk affordably. We also ensure that payout triggers are clearly defined, so when disasters strike, there is a reliable mechanism in place to provide timely financial relief. Um, the support will also extend to defining the scope of coverage, making sure essential areas such as infrastructure and livelihoods are protected. Furthermore, we would advocate for solutions to facilitate premium payments, ensuring that these protections are accessible to all. And then finally, the, well, sorry, not finally, but the next um, crucial aspect of the DSS is to be a crucial partner in supporting resilient investment for small island developing states. This is where we would assist in strategic planning and project viability assessments to ensure that every investment contributes to long-term sustainability. Additionally, we would want to prioritize transparency and accountability measures to manage funds responsibly and as well as to maintain trust. And finally, um, the DSS will play a vital role in offering expert advisory and legal support to SIDS. Um, first, we would want to provide detailed assessments that uncover the complex intersection between debt and climate impacts, ensuring that our financial strategies address both. So the focus on developing local legal expertise ensures that SIDS are well equipped to negotiate debt and investment agreements that align with their long-term goals. By leveraging collective political strength, we can advocate for policies that reflect the unique challenges faced by SIDS in the global financial discussions. Almost done. So now we'll go into our recommendations for national focal points. Great. So as national focal points, we should work closely with the DSS to strengthen national debt management strategies. This engagement will allow um, countries such as SIDS to access concessional financing and build capacity for sustainable debt management, ensuring long-term economic um, stability. Utilizing the SIDS data, um, global data hub is also crucial for improving national data infrastructure, which we would have discussed yesterday. NF NFPs can also use this resource to enhance data collection and reporting on the SDGs, ensuring that national progress is effectively monitored and reported. NFPs should also collaborate with the SIDS Center of Excellence to integrate climate resilience and sustainable ocean economy strategies into our national development plans. This would help to essentially align national priorities uh, with global sustainability goals and foster economic growth that is both resilient and sustainable. As NFP, NFPs, we are also encouraged to promote approaches that are gender responsive and inclusive. This ensures that development strategies lead to equitable growth where all persons in society, particularly marginalized and vulnerable groups, can benefit from national policies as well as national initiatives. Um, essentially, by prioritizing regional partnerships, um, NFPs can share lessons learned and scale up successful interventions across SIDS. Um, collaborative efforts would also a, allow us um, as SIDS to build on each other's experiences and success, which will um, lead to more effective regional solutions to shared challenges. And to wrap up, I would like to say that the Antigua and Barbuda Agenda for SIDS provides us a clear framework for achieving resilient prosperity for SIDS by 2034. So once we, as National Focal Points, can engage with tools like the Debt Sustainability Support Service and the SIDS Center of Excellence and collaborating with the international community, we can turn the Abbas vision into a reality. Let us continue to strengthen um, partnerships and empower each other as we move forward to ensure the resilience and sustainable development of our small island states. And this ends my presentation. Thank you very much, Garth, for such a comprehensive uh, presentation uh, on the, you know, the context 
of the Centre for Excellence, the three pillars uh, and the services that it will be pro uh, providing. So now it's my pleasure to turn the floor to Mr. Bridget Thomas, uh, who is the policy coordinator uh, of the Office of the President of Palau. You have the floor. Um, thank you, Andy. Ali um, Ungituta, and good morning, Excellencies and colleagues. Like the presenters before me, I want to thank the government and the people of um, Vanuatu for the warm hospitality. Um, and I also want to thank um, our colleagues from the UN, OHR, LLS for all the arrangement and for bringing us all here to this beautiful island of um, Vanuatu. Um, my name is Bridge Thomas. I am based in the Policy and Planning uh, Unit in the Office of the President in Palau. And for my presentation today, um, I was uh, asked to focus on the oceans and the BBNJ agreement. As such, those are the, uh, are the topics that I will be focusing on. So in my presentation, I will aim to address uh, these uh, three points that you see on the screen. Uh, and these are really like reflected on um, three of the guiding questions that were, sorry, sorry. Oh, okay. Oh. So um, in my presentation, I will aim to address these three uh, points that you see on the screen. And these are really reflected on the, um, um, three of the guiding questions that were provided in the uh, uh, concept note of the session. So the first one uh, being on the promotion of uh, sustainable blue economies in seeds, looking at some strategies and actions to ensure the long-term viability and sustainability of blue economy, of blue economies in seeds. Um, the second point is driving um, digital transformation, uh, particularly looking at some ideas for supporting SIDS, leverage digital technologies to accelerate development, enhance resilience and improve governance. And finally, looking at the ratification and implementation of the BBNJ agreement and the necessary support to enhance um, our capacities in its implementation. So while I was working on my presentation, I, I sort of had to answer uh, like this question myself, uh, um, so why the ocean? <clears throat> so as SIDS, we are home to vibrant um, marine biodiversity. Um, the ocean is deeply intertwined with our livelihoods, cultures, and identities. And um, I guess just to share a Palawan perspective, we have uh, two main island groups. Uh, to the north, we have the big island of Babal Dab, uh, that's Bab meaning upper and Dab meaning um, the ocean. And to the south, we have Yo Dab with Yo uh, meaning lower and Dab, of course, meaning um, ocean. So that's already an indication of how much um, the ocean relates to our identity as a people. Um, as SIDS, so we are stewards of the ocean. Uh, together, we manage 19.1% of the world's EEZs and the resources that live within these EEZs. And um, the ocean is our biggest carbon sink, and it is our biggest ally in our fight against climate change. Um, the ocean and its resources that we as uh, uh, SIDS are especially um, dependent on our food security and livelihoods are under uh, considerable stress from anthropogenic sources. Um, and furthermore, our vulnerabilities are impacting our ability to protect uh, uh, this uh, shared ecosystem. And that is why it is important that oceans um, be an integral part of our dialogues, uh, uh, specifically looking at how we can work with our partners to ensure a sustainable and effective um, ocean management. So um, this slide that you see on the screen looks at some of the ways to ensure the long-term viability and sustainability of blue economy in SIDS. Uh, um, so back home, um, 
we've been working on our enhanced NDCs, um, our NAPs and our NBSAPs. Um, and a key focus has been ensuring integration among the indicators in these reports and plans to create a more coherent and effective climate action strategy. And that same focus sort of applies to the ocean as we are concurrently developing a sustainable ocean plan that will be unveiled next year and currently implementing a marine spatial planning process to prioritize conservation, domestic fishing zones, and tourism sites. Um, just what I attempted to, to do here was to create a matrix outlining um, uh, some strategies um, based on what do SIDS want uh, related to the ocean and the marine environment as outlined in the ABAS. And um, these um, strategies are further um, sort of um, categorized into um, um, different categories, including sustainable fisheries, marine conservation, blue carbon, and ocean-based industries. And then um, also within this um, um, matrix, um, what I attempted to do was link these strategies to various UN frameworks and conventions. Um, and I would, um, I think the purpose of this exercise was to um, address a point that was in the concept note of the session. And just to read it, it's policy coherence is critical to dealing with the main implementation challenges that sits face. And I think the Abbas um, implementation plan is, is to, um, it's an opportunity to really prioritize the seamless coordination across different conventions and frameworks and, and even like regional processes to really ensure that we are able to maximize on the opportunities that arise in these different uh, sort of processes. Um, in the interest of time, I, like, I'm not gonna delve into the details of this matrix. Uh, um, it's uh, straightforward and pretty self-explanatory. And I think the materials of our meetings uh, will be shared with everybody else so you can have a look at it um, uh, when it's shared. Um, oops, sorry. And then I... I um, also like looked at some key areas for digital transformation in relation to the strategies that I just mentioned for promoting blue economy in SIDS. So um, the first one is um, data and information management. So investing in digital technologies to collect, analyze and share data on ocean resources, climate conditions and economic activities, um, developing um, data-driven decision-making tools to support sustainable management and, and resource allocation. The um, uh, second um, area is technology adoption. So pro promoting the adoption of innovative technologies to improve efficiency, reducing costs and enhancing sustainability in ocean-based industries. And I guess just to share an example, um, in Palau, one of our primary challenges as a, as a big ocean state, if I may put it that way, is ensuring effective uh, surveillance of our EEZ. Um, and, and this is due to limited personnel and high fuel costs for surveillance vessels. The technology offers a promising solution, um, but while, um, the, like, while the technology exists, the, the financing remains the critical barrier. And I uh, think through the Abbas, it's, it's an opportunity to explore with our partners um, collaboration with uh, external development partners to, to acquire these technologies. And then the last uh, uh, point um, is on capacity building, investing in training and capacity building programs to equip stakeholders with the skills and knowledge needed to effectively utilize digital technologies and drive sustainable development in the ocean-based uh, economy. Um, if we look at the previous slide uh, across the different, um, um, sorry, across the different um, uh, frameworks and conventions, uh, 
there are provisions within these frameworks that mention the use of technology within these different strategies. Uh, so now I will move on to um, the discussion on the BBNJ agreement. Uh, so on the screen is a table um, that I um, obtained from the High Seas Alliance website. Um, basically, um, it's a list of the countries that have ratified the High Seas Treaty. And for the treaty to enter into force, we need at least 60 ratifications by the UN Ocean Conference next year. So far, uh, like based on this list, the 13 countries have ratified the treaty with 10 of these countries being SIDS. I think that really signifies the importance of the ocean to SIDS, um, having the SIDS been some of the first uh, um, ratifiers of the um, agreement. Uh, just more, um, more specifically on the SIDS, uh, again, there are 10 that have ratified, 18 that have signed but not have not yet ratified and 11 that have not taken action yet. Um, <clears throat> I don't wanna get into any sort of political discussions, but I think it's a safe space to encourage the 18 that have signed to ratify and also the 11 uh, that have not taken any action. Um, just to share a brief history, uh, Palau was the first to ratify the treaty um, we wanted to be the first one to sign, but our sister nation of the Federated States of Micronesia beat us to that uh, in 2023. Um, and then I would just like to point out several reasons why ratifying the BBNJ. So uh, the first point is on the protection of marine biodiversity. Uh, the BBNJ agreement establishes a framework for the conservation and sustainable use of resources beyond national jurisdiction. And this is um, especially important for us because we rely heavily on unhealthy on, on, on marine ecosystems for our livelihoods and well-being. The second point is on climate change mitigation. Um, the ocean plays a vital role in regulating uh, the Earth's climate. Uh, and by protecting um, marine biodiversity and addressing threats like pollution and overfishing, um, the BBNJ can contribute to climate change, our climate change mitigation efforts. Uh, the third point is, this, and is unsustainable development. Uh, the BBNJ. Sorry. I meant to show this slide when I was explaining the, the bits uh, that have ratified, have signed, but have not ratified, and then bits that have not taken any action. So. so um, just to continue on the, um, the reasons why it's important to, um, to ratify the BBNJ um, um, agreement. I think I've covered the first two um, points. And then the third one was unsustainable development. Um, the BBNJ agreement promotes the sustainable development by ensuring that the use of resources is balanced with the need to conserve uh, um, biodiversity. So again, that balance is very important for us in order to drive uh, truly uh, sustainable blue economies. Um, and this can help SIDS achieve their sustainable development goals and improve li the livelihoods of their people. The fourth point being um, benefit sharing. Um, the BBNJ agreement includes provisions for benefit sharing, which can help us access the benefits of um, marine genetic resources and ensure that um, we receive a fair share of the profits from using these resources. And then um, lastly, um, in this slide, the, the last point is on capacity building and technology transfer. Uh, the agreement provides for capacity building and technology transfer to support uh, uh, countries like ours in implementing the agreement and benefiting from its provisions. So um, 
just to share some examples of addressing the high seas in our region, perhaps these, uh, like, we haven't really started, we're still in the uh, stages of discussion and, and, and exploring uh, further capacity building um, opportunities for, for uh, SIDS to implement the uh, treaty. But um, I think some of you may have already heard of this initiative, uh, specifically colleagues from uh, the SPC, because this is being led by the SPC as well as the colleagues from PIF. Um, this was launched, the Unlocking Blue Pacific Prosperity was launched um, in uh, COP28 by Pacific leaders. Uh, and among the things that it strives to uh, do is to facilitate a regional cooperation for the high seas, which the Office of the Pacific Ocean Commissioner will take the lead on. And also, and also um, again, in line with the um, implementation of the BBNJ agreement, uh, uh, is the BBNJ First Movers, which was launched in um, New York in uh, just last month. Uh, and, and really it focuses on the urgency for the BBNJ ratification. Um, and the BBNJ agreement is crucial for ocean conservation and the sustainable use of, uh, of the resources. And ratification is urgently needed to achieve uh, the 30 by 30 goal and protect marine biodiversity. Um, and also it aims to create um, well-connected and biologically representative MPAs in the high seas, which is essential for achieving our, our shared uh, 30 by 30 goal. And also, um, and also developing high seas MPA proposals requires a, a collaborative um, action. I think that concludes my my presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much, Bridge, for reiterating the importance of oceans to all of us, uh, and also the priority actions that we need to take uh, to protect and, and conserve the ocean. Uh, so colleagues, it's my pleasure to now hand over uh, to Mr. Dominic uh, Sofe, the Program Management Officer at UNOHRLS to make his presentation on the important issue of digitalization. You have the floor, Dominic. Good morning, everyone. Um, excellencies, uh, participants, and also before I begin, I would like to um, thank um, Anwatu government for the reception last night. I, I still think I am doped up from the cover last night, so bear with me. I will make this as fun as possible and as uh, informative as I can. Uh, today's presentation uh, will foc focus on digital connectivity and digitalization as key drivers uh, for achieving sustainable development in SIDS. Um, when I was preparing the presentation, I went and looked back at the Samoa pathway and I did a quick search of digital connectivity and it it wasn't a surprise when I didn't find one reference to it. Um, so having this focus in our bus uh, is a big ask uh, for SIDS and also it reflects how much important for sustainable development for SIDS. Um, looking at the SIDS context in a digital world, um, one of the special circumstances that characterizes SIDS or the vulnerabilities for SIDS is their isolation from the rest of the world. And it has become a hindrance in their sustainable development. Now the cost of getting the necessary resources and services to the islands is high and just becomes one of the barriers for the development of SIDS. Uh, therefore, this is a cornerstone for the future development of SIDS. Thank you, Anya. Uh, you were connected there, so I was connecting with you, yes. And with 67% of the population connected, there is a significant progress um, being made in SIDS, but there are disparities um, that, that persist, uh, particularly in uh, smaller and more remote islands. And basic access uh, digitalization offers opportunities for 
economic diversification, enhancing resilience to climate change, and improving governance. Um, however, affordability and um, infrastructure gaps remain key challenges that must be addressed to unlock the full potentials of uh, digitalization. Uh, this is the map of the world's infrastructure connectivity. It was produced by ITU. And I don't know, it was interesting to see all those submarine cables along the ocean lines, ocean floors, just to see how massive the infrastructure that needs is needed for connectivity, especially for our SIDS and especially the remote islands. So it's, it was interesting. Um, now the key challenges that I wanted to touch upon for the SIDS, um, while it presents digitalization presents very, very important opportunities, um, there are significant challenges that still persist. Uh, I mentioned before the affordability, so there's a high cost of broadband and SIDS, and it continues to limit the access, um, especially in rural and remote islands. Um, in addition, there's a growing need to develop the digital skills, uh, particularly for the underrepresented or the marginalized groups. Um, policy fragmentation remains a critical issue. The digital initiatives must be integrated across, across different sectors to ensure coherence. And now, finally, there's a dire need for improved digital infrastructure across all SIDS, uh, especially in the small islands. And you see that there's uh, the lower internet usage, uh, particularly in rural areas, um, um, differs from the people in the, in the urban areas. Um, there's inadequate digital skills. Um, and then we talk about the persistent gender digital divide in SIDS. And this is something that we need to highlight when we talk about digital connectivity. To bridge these divides, our first priority must be we need to connect the unconnected. That's the first thing we need to do. And beyond access, we must also um, equip, uh, equip them with the necessary digital skills and the literacy to fully leverage the benefits of the internet and the digital world. And it requires innovat innovative, scalable solutions uh, tailored to specific needs of SIDS. Now, Ambassador mentioned yesterday uh, the chapters of the, the ABAS. So I too uh, also want to touch on it very briefly in looking at a digital uh, lens. And what do SIDS want? Uh, from the digital connectivity side of things, um, there's an ecosystem for growth. Significant challenges in, in building the ecosystem and the institutions necessary to fully leverage STI or science, technology, and innovation. Um, there are, these are the essential tools for growth. Um, Garth has also mentioned the COE, the SID Center of Excellence, as well as the touching on the technology and innovation mechanism, as well as the Island Investment Forum. Now, now speaking from an OHLLS perspective, we also have the SIDS Global Business Network Forum, that's also every two years. So it'll be it'll be important to see how these two businesses complement one another and to fully leverage what is needed from the business world to support the SIDS. And and then we see strengthening e-government. Um, I understand it. I forgot the name of the the your plan that you have for a digital Tuvalu. Perhaps I'll putting you on the spot here later on for to, to show us or tell us about it. Now, how do SIDS get there? Those are Vanuatu kids. I took the picture there when I was coming down here. I quickly put it in there. Digital cooperation. The digital technologies. Talk about us helping ourselves before we we ask our partners to help us, you know, and also the for our partners to see that we are doing the work on the ground and makes investment come in three, four, four. Speak about in, in all the, the whole of government that should be looked at as well. Enabling policy environment along the same lines and then capacity building and innovation. We heard um, Gopal speak about the need for building the capacity of the SIDS, and this is a, an important part of digitalization. We look at inclusive digital societies. Um, I mentioned briefly the gender, the digital divide, 
that needs to be closed. That gap needs to close, especially in SIDS and among the different SIDS regions. Um, this is this picture here is I like this picture. This is the market in downtown in Port Vila, and just looks at the Abbas and the alignment with SDGs. Um, the two are closely aligned. Uh, for instance, the SDG eight highlight the importance of digital skills and capacities to drive economic growth, while uh, SDG nine focuses on infrastructure and seventeen on partnerships and effective implementation of digital initiatives require coordination. And the alignment of these goal, global frameworks to ensure sustainable outcomes for SIDS. Well, in the others, the SIDS story has been clear, right? In the aftermath of COVID-19, it was very clear that the digital infrastructure was necessary to keep the economy um, output going. That we were left behind during that period. So we're slowly coming back and we have our developed partners infrastructures in set for digital and they were able to bounce back quickly. Um, some opportunities for transformation. As mentioned before, economic diversification um, it offers new pathways for SIDS. We look at e-tourism and how we can leverage that for SIDS. Part of our, our narrative, government services mentioned before. And climate resilience is an important one. Um, I don't want to pretend that I'm a climate expert, but I understand that the two go hand in hand in building the resilience that we need, and especially enhancing our disaster preparedness and global partnership. We cannot do this alone. Uh, we need our partners to help us. Very quickly, the role of the NFP uh, in this space. You know, um, you play a, a very important role as Ambassador Luteri mentioned yesterday. Um, suggesting that you, NFPs, become the champions of Abbas. And being the NFP, you are at the heart of driving digital transformation in the SIDS, um, coordinating the efforts at the national level, ensuring alignment uh, between digital policies and global frameworks as the SDGs uh, and the Abbas. And beyond coordination, you are also central in building the capacity within the country, um, the skills and infrastructure where we could link uh, the our regional commissions and our RCOs and MCO office come together to work with the NFP and see how we can bring the support that we need uh, through enhancing the digital connectivity on the ground. Uh, I've touched on these before, so I wouldn't go in again. Um, policy coherence, that's a picture of here in Vanuatu, I believe. Now, for the office, uh, OHRLLS, um, we're strengthening the support systems. Um, we co-chair the IACG together with DESA, and this is where we can bring in the entire UN system, UN development system, um, to find pathways and find all the avenues that we can to bring the digitalization connectivity to the SIDS and how we can help them. And we facilitate the collaborations with our RCI and regional commissions, uh, mobilize resources um, where we come in with our partner to connect initiative where we, uh, our USG is uh, the a commissioner for the broadband commission. There have been pledges and I was speaking with Millie. For me to be done, the mic is done, oh, I'm back. Thank you very much. Uh...
very much, uh, Dominic, about reminding us about the the importance of connectivity, and you know, just sitting in Vanuatu and and the capital, you can see you know also what Vanuatu is experiencing with the the internet going uh, on and off, and and you know, just my experience in the Pacific, um, it very very much varies depending on which country you're in, uh, but also I think you know, and Dominic, you mentioned this. This is you know, it's one thing to be in the center of the country. But as you go further out, uh, it becomes uh, more challenging. And I think one of the issues uh, for us in the Pacific is just basic connectivity and particularly the last mile, uh, because that's where the, you know, and if you look at some of the, the countries variation, you know, we've got small atolls, but we have some countries which are quite mountainous. Uh, and so those are the people that are also uh, disadvantaged. So the presenters have done very well. Uh, we've still got about another 20 minutes before morning tea. So I thought um, we could, you know, have some some comments, questions uh, until we break for morning tea. Uh, I think it's important we do break for morning tea before we then do the second part, so everybody comes back fresh. So, uh, colleagues, the the floor is open if anybody wants to comment. Oh right, all hands are going up. Everybody's awake today. <laughs> okay, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, from the Maldives, uh, I would like to share some uh, experiences that we have had, and uh, I would like to highlight. Uh, yesterday, we talked about uh, the capacity in processing data and engaging in uh, utilizing data for decision making. But another area that we really need to talk about is when we are talking about uh, uh, moving into digitalization as yes. The systems and the legal frameworks and the yes, infrastructure yes, we need yes, to really uh, yes. bring on the digitalization. And in the Maldives, we have had some experiences where we are uh, moving towards uh, more digital uh, yes. form of government and also uh, public services. And uh, one of the key areas or roadblocks that we are experiencing at the moment is uh, having the lack of relevant legal framework. So the frameworks are outdated. And uh, also uh, things like cybersecurity, we are working on uh, uh, bringing on the legislation that is required. Yes. And also we have had a, a, a positive experience of COVID, I must say that it was a transformational opportunity for us to really move into e-platforms, uh, both uh, for service provision uh, for the public, as well as health, education, and this kind of uh, uh, sectors as well. And uh, we've been working for like past uh, 10, 15 years to bring these changes and investing in uh, skills building and infrastructure uh, for it, but it was being, it was finding it difficult that to make the behavioral change in the people, but the, uh, the COVID facilitated this jump or shift in uh, transforming uh, our uh, systems into more e uh, and wide, more widely accepted by the people. And one area that we, um, uh, progressively did well was the e-banking system. So now we already have, we have more people using the uh, e-banking and then uh, normal uh, transitions. And this has brought about uh, a lot of SMEs uh, in place. And then we have seen it, it benefited the small and medium sized businesses very much. And this again called for more legal uh, uh, legal frameworks uh, such as copyright laws and uh, intellectual property rights laws. And then now we are uh, moving into the international arena. Like we are always talking about seeds, about uh, broadening our economy, diversification and all that. But we really need to have these laws in place if we want to probably uh, uh, be operating in an international uh, arena as well. So these are things that we are currently working on. And uh, with uh, the e-government, I think we have reached quite an advanced level where we have we don't have any, all, all government or state 
payments has to be through an online portal. So we don't have a, a money transactions within the government. And uh, I think this is what uh, Dominic was referring to about uh, policy coherence, where we all need to really align all the um, all the um, sectors need to align uh, where so now we have implemented where all subsidies and all um, uh, assistance by the government would be through e-portals and also digitally dispersed. So there's more transparency and more accountability integrated uh, into as well. And then we're talking about the digital divide here uh, as well. And then surprisingly, we have seen that women are taking on to be in more higher education because of the change in online uh, teaching facilities that's established now. So people uh, who are with children has uh, picked up on uh, uh, being engaged in higher education more and they've enrolled in courses. And uh, that that's a fantastic, uh, I think, a change that we have brought in. But for it to happen, we had lots of investments in the systems and in the necessary infrastructure, like the broadband internet, and we have been working on it for like 10 or 15 years already. So it was the digital transformation was easier when the time came in to change into these platforms. And as you understand, the biggest uh, problem in SIDS is the disparity and uh, also disbursement of people. So things like telemedicine are catching up in my country. And then, as I said, mentioned COVID like really facilitated and forced people to like really take on this, uh, bring in the behavior change. And uh, I think people are sticking to it. And that's uh, some lessons that uh, I would want to share with the other countries. Thank you. Very much. Um... I'll now give the floor, I think it was Barbados, then maybe, oh, oh, sorry, it's Cuba. Cuba and then the UK, and then if we have time, we'll come to you. Yes, good morning, everyone. I would like to uh, recognize the presentation of all the panelists. I have only uh, one comment, one suggestion, and one question. A suggestion, first of all, I would like to recognize the government of Antigua and Barbuda to put forward this center of excellence during the uh, Antigua and Barbuda conference. And I think it was a very important step. And um, all of us now have to work together in order that the center fulfill what we want. So regarding the, the center, I would like to propose maybe by uh, the, the, that the office of OHRLLS and maybe through the regional committees, commissions, to have a kind of workshop to the member states in order they know how, how we can engage with the center, what support they need from us. I think it's going to be important in order to understand the work of, of the center, uh, because it's very challenging the work that seeing the all the scope that you have is, is going to be very challenging. And I think that you need also the support of member states. Regarding the, the data collection, I have a, a, a question. How do you foresee to collect the data? Is through the statistical office of the country, through the uh, statistical division of the United Nations, through both of them? So this is, uh, because I think it's important that all the data that you have, have to be validated by governments. So for us, this is very important. And I would like to know how do you plan to do this? Maybe we'll we'll um, go to the UK and then we can then have a wrap up with all the presenters if they want to just ask. okay so UK hi okay great thank you um I thought these were incredibly interesting presentations actually I really enjoyed all of them it was really useful so thank you very much um, and there are a lot of things I may ask you all about um, later but just a couple of quick questions. Um, one of them, actually, I think um, on tech, on digital connectivity, I'm extremely interested in technological innovation and what we can do as a donor to try to promote more in that area to support um, SIDS development. And so I'm just very interested in your ideas about that. And you didn't mention, I thought your maps and everything were really interesting, but you didn't at all mention um, satellite connectivity 
or also artificial intelligence. I don't think anybody's talked about that at all. It's probably the first meeting in 2024 when nobody's been talking about it, actually. Um, but I noticed that um, Prime Minister Motley in one of her presentations at UNGA, she talked about her fear that it would create more of a divide as developing countries got left behind as AI developed. So I'm interested in whether you've um, just thought about that, if that's something that you're sort of bringing into um, these ideas about connectivity. And on the center of excellence, I'd just be interested if there's anything that you could say about um, how you're looking at donors interacting with it and what the funding um, model is that um, that you have. Thank you. Thank you. So my suggestion is we I'll go give the floor to Mauritius far more. Uh, <laughs> OK, so we're going to run out of time. Um, so can I just ask? OK, so far more than then uh, Mauritius, and then I'll give the panelists the chance to respond, and maybe if you hold fire till the next session, if that's okay, yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, everyone. Just uh, a few points. Uh, firstly, I'm trying to make the connection uh, between this uh, session and what we need to do moving forward. I think when you look at the the areas that have been identified or the key areas, I think we've got to be very clear in terms of what this means going forward. When you look at the ABAS, there's 10 action clusters. Three of those can be termed as cross-cutting in nature. These are, of course, data science, technology, innovation, digitization, and then the issue of partnership. And I think what we need to do is to be very clear in terms of where we're going with this. Because, for example, the discussion on the center of excellence is something that took place at the regional level, at the inter-regional level, it went through the um, G77 and the intergovernmental uh, negotiation. So we, we basically uh, agree on the principles. You know, what we need to, to finalize are the details. How many people will manage the center, et cetera, et cetera. So why I'm raising this is that we need to be clear that you know, the principles in terms of the three areas of focus as well has been agreed. It has been agreed. So, you know, I, I'm trying to connect how we, you know, the outcome of this in terms of the process uh, moving forward. So that's the, the first uh, comment that I wish to make. And I think the the discussion this uh, morning is very much on some of those cross-cutting issues. The only one that I haven't heard is is on partnership, because we've we've heard data quite a lot, and I think the discussion around the global data hub is very important as well in terms of how that will pan out and how that is going to be managed uh, moving forward, and the connection between the global data hub, SIDS data hub, and the national and regional organization or institutions that are responsible for data in our countries. The second uh, point I wish to make relates to ocean. Um, I, I think this is uh, an extremely important uh, sort of priority for uh, SITS. But I, I wonder, uh, Madam Chair, in terms of our focus, um, I think it would have been uh, perhaps uh, opportune to hear from our national focal points in terms of how do we see the ocean and what are the possible action. Uh, for example, the health of the ocean. I, I think we want to make sure that's a top priority. Uh, and therefore, the connection with that is that we have the plastic pollution negotiation sets on the way. Now, how you know can we get into that space? Because it's very important for us. 
So those are the things, you know, uh, illegal, uh, unreported, uh, unregulated fishing. Again, that is part of what we need to look at in terms of our economic, uh, you know, prosperity. And then I, I just finished by saying that one of the key, two key uh, action clusters deal with people. You know, uh, the uh, safe and secure society, for example, uh, and prosperous uh, society. I raise that because I think at the end of the day, I go back to the point that I made, that it's all about our people on the ground and what we need to focus on. You know, all these things where there is connectivity, it's geared towards helping them, you know, manage the challenge that they face on the ground. So I just want to raise those uh, points and try to make the connection so that we're clear in terms of the process as we uh, move forward. And thank you very much for all the presentation. Thank you, Ambassador. I'll now give the floor to Mauritius and then I'll ask the panelists to respond. Thank you and good morning. Uh colleagues. Um, I, I should also say that I thoroughly enjoyed all the three presentations this morning. Okay. <laughs> and um, to say also that um, how uh, uh, lucky we are to have uh, Ambassador Solomon as chair of AOS to be among us, because one of the issues I, I wanted to raise was about the Center of Excellence, and I think you address uh, most of my concerns. Um, but I was wondering, okay, we are talking about the center, but how at the end of the day is it going to be administered? How is it going to be financed over time? Uh, I think these are questions that we, we need to understand. And partnership, uh, which is a key word all along ABAS, um, how does the Center of Excellence partners with other centers of excellence? I mean, in, in other regions, in all the cities, uh, like in Mauritius, we have a multidisciplinary center of excellence. And uh, I, I was looking at the Aruba Center of Excellence on SIDS. I mean, we have a whole uh, list of uh, centers of excellence. So how um, the the one uh, envisage in Abbas uh, going to uh, network and uh, collaborate with this? Um, I think uh, probably when we, we move along with time, we'll, we'll discuss and... Uh, uh, develop those uh, even more. Um, and uh, uh, Dominic, I think your presentation was uh, among the most important because SIDS connectivity, maritime connectivity, air connectivity is already a challenge. I mean, sometimes um, Maldives is uh, next door, but going to Maldives, I have to travel to Dubai and then to probably to Maldives or to, to India, somewhere in Delhi or Mumbai. And so that, that is an issue. But digital connectivity, which is increasingly becoming important if we want to be uh, uh, you know, uh, connected to, uh, to the world. Um, my friend from uh, Maldives did share her experience about a um, country. I think we all have such experiences to share. But that is only possible if we are connected to the outside world. And now uh, for Mauritius, um, in terms of cable, I think we have just two table, uh, two cables, major cables connecting Mauritius. And uh, fortunately, it doesn't happen often, but sometimes you have those cables, one of the cables uh, is damaged and we have connectivity issue. So uh, connecting I, uh, SIDS to the world, that is an issue. I mean, it's about, we are talking about massive uh, funding, I understand. But then um, uh, our friend from the UK did he raised that uh, issue of connectivity, satellite connectivity. So uh, we have to probably elaborate on that also. And on, on BBNJ, um, uh, our friend from Palau, I think he emphasized uh, enough uh, that uh, we as SIDS uh, should be at the forefront of the implementation of BBNG and 
how are we going to talk about implementation if we don't sign and ratify? And I, I think uh, I, I've seen Commonwealth Secretariat circulating some survey forms. I don't know how many of uh, us uh, have received that because mo many of, of us are also members of uh, Commonwealth. Uh, talking about capacity building for signature and ratification. And I, I, I believe that Commonwealth Secretariat can, can be and is already uh, an important partner that we should be also working with. And uh, uh, I think I forgot to mention Commonwealth yesterday. I, I take this opportunity to, to, to highlight that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I will now give the opportunity uh, to the panelists and I'll just give it, give them in the order that they uh, presented. So Garth. All right, thank you everyone for your questions and comments. I will do my best to respond um, to the ones directed to the Center of Excellence. Um, I noted my colleague from Cuba, I think you had the first question um, in terms of if the Center of Excellence, um, specifically the Global Data Hub, will be housing UN data or more national statistical data. Um, what I want to point out first is that before we can share data, we have to collect it. Uh, we saw yesterday um, when my colleague from the UN <laughs> um, showed us how the amount of data gaps that we have um, in terms of data that's available. I think what we first need to work on is what tools do we need to make available for us to collect the data that is missing um, as well as making it presentable. I think once we can identify the tools that we need um, to help us in collecting our data um, that is needed, then we can work around um, specifically um, how what data do we share, um, especially some data is very sensitive. So we also have to look at how we can ensure that we're not, you know, um, given our data that is you know very sensitive. So I think we work at looking at the tools that we need uh, to collect our data and then we would have to discuss um, you know as a collaborative effort um, what data uh, we will share and where will it all come from. Um, I think um, from the United Kingdom we had the question of how would the sense of excellence engage with donors? Correct? Yes. So the Sense of Excellence is supposed to, um, as I would have mentioned, house different key areas where we can develop a lot of collaborative and partnership efforts. I think in the Sense of Excellence, uh, we'll have to identify um, who are the main target donors in terms of um, providing us with financial assistance. Um, we know we have the Green Climate Fund, we have the Adaptation Fund, the Global Environment Facility. Um, I think we'll have to engage with them, uh, discuss uh, with them our priorities, our needs, as well as the streamlining of processes um, for us to be able to achieve a lot of um, the priorities that we have outlined in our ABAS. Um, Yes, I noted that from Ambassador and Marish. Ah, keep I keep pronouncing your name wrong. I'm so sorry. Um, Ma, Marishis, Marish. <laughs> um, yeah, I do agree in terms of we have to now focus on how do we get things in place and things together. I think right now what we are trying to do, as I was um speaking with um Tomasi uh, from the UN office, is we're now seeking to leverage a lot of financial and technical resources at this point to help with the implementation of the SIDS Center of Excellence, because we understand that SIDS Center of Excellence is supposed to be a very big and global hub for SIDS. And so it's going to require a lot of work, it's going to require a lot of financial support, a lot of technical support. So um, I do appreciate the comments, and these are also areas that we are further looking into. Um, I'll give my other colleagues a chance to respond as well. Thank you. And you can also buttonhole Garth, of course, in the in between our sessions. Um, thank you for the comments. I think uh, for myself, I'll only, um, I guess, sort of react to the um, uh, UK um, in sort of a general uh, note. The, um, you asked what can development partners do? Um, just to share an example of, of what we are currently working on with our NDCs is the um, last year we reached our goal of uh, 
uh, 20% renewable in our uh, sort of our energy mix. Our next goal is 45%, if I'm not mistaken, by 2025. Now the struggle is the how to get there. Um, there's been a number of um, uh, plans and like studies formulated, but then I think because of all of those plans, we're at a point of just like like analysis, paralysis, uh, like different partners, they come in and with their own sort of set of expertise and recommendations, uh, but then there's no sort of uh, a cohesive uh, plan on like this is the uh, best option for Palau and, and that we have to follow. So I think just coming to terms with our development partners on one sort of cohesive plan and also um, and also uh, like simply like deploying the technology to support the uh, islands uh, in um, accelerating uh, their energy transition and really just building resilience. Uh, thank you. If I may, moderator, thank you so much. Um, but thank you so much for the feedback and all the the interventions. I think it's it's really good to you know get the noggin thinking about the next session coming up, where we also look at partnerships. As uh, Ambassador Luteri has mentioned, uh, one of the important parts of the work that we do as SIDS, it's the only way we can move forward, um, especially being NFPs. But I wanted to just touch on. Um, UK's question. Um, for the AI part, I will divert it, if you'll allow me, um, moderator, to Tishka, to give a little back. She's looking at me like, why are you doing this? <laughs> Don't blame me, blame the cover. Um, but I, I wanted to, to just, you asked the question about how can the partners come in and support the work on digital connectivity? Um, well, through the ABAS is basically how I would answer it because the ABAS, even though it is a SID's own um, roadmap, you know, it has a SID stamp on it, but it is an intergovernmentally negotiated document where the UK's issues were also reflected and they have a stake in it. And as I mentioned earlier in my presentation about policy coherence, in the ABAS itself, um, in the section where it says, how do SIDS get there? And there's paragraphs that mention the assistance that the SIDS need in terms of, you know, um, developing national legislations around these digital connectivity issue, as Maldives has mentioned. And we can look at building the capacity of the different ministries or the agencies that deal with digital connectivity. But it goes back on the others because it's what we agreed. It's not what something that just the SIDS agreed. It's what SIDS agreed, what the development partners agreed, the international community. Um, and it has the stake for, for the CSOs to work, to use the ABAS to leverage the resources that they need to support the SIDS on the ground. And I'm looking at 3Link because 3Link is in the room and, they, and this is part of their work in Vanuatu. And so I'm hoping that 3Link is hearing, um, you know, what is actually needed and what is guided from the Abbas so that they can, I don't know, I wouldn't want to say realign or refocus, but maybe magnify the work that they do, um, leaning towards the Abbas and what is asked so that they can have the support from the, the partners on the ground as well. And to go back to helping the people, which is part of why we are here and the Abbas for the next 10 years. On the satellite issue, I also lean back to Tishka because that is part of the AI. Tishka, you have the floor, I'm sorry. Here you go. Good. Good morning. Um, of course, I can't answer that question in fully. Um, I'm no AI expert, but I do know that through the work of the USGS Broadband Commissioner, she's working to um, find solutions and uh, pretty much scope the work around AI and its impact on most vulnerable countries. So as she's doing that work, we'll, of course, look at the ABAS and see how the, the the priorities align with the work we will be doing to carry forward AI and it, its impact. So as we get more information on that, I'll, we'll, we'll of course share that. It'll probably be 
a report that we can share online and uh, we'll keep you abreast of developments in that respect. Satellites, we'll have, again, I'll have to, <laughs> to get back on information on that um, for you. But also just to note that we have a, a consultant that been, has been working with us um, on digitalization in SIDS um, uh, in Pacific. We have it through the both all the regions, but the one who's worked on the specific, she will be speaking later in the set, next part of the session and perhaps can touch on those kinds of issues as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's probably an opportune time for us to have morning tea. So I'll hand over to our MC, Chief Organizer. <laughs> well, we're on fire this morning. Um... I, I, I was going to say uh, the, the kava has worked, but the, most people intervening today did not drink kava last night. So, um, yeah, I think it's perhaps a good thing you didn't drink kava. We'll have a, a quick 20-minute uh, break uh, now as, uh, as uh, the, the, the presentations have been excellent so far. Um, please, uh, they will be shared online and the links will be, will be shared uh, at some point. Uh, by the uh, OHRLS team. Have a quick 20 minutes coffee break and then we'll come back for more uh, on this session. Um, Barbados, you'll have the floor as soon as we... Oh, did you... All right. Thank you. Thanks so much. It was just to add to what Tishka was saying um, and in response to the UK's um, question as it relates to AI and then obviously building on what Tishka said that we have the Global Digital Compact which um, is part of the Pact of the Future which also speaks to some AI issues um, and also some of the um, vulnerable countries such as SIDS and you know the possibility of AI as it relates to early warning systems, climate, agriculture, etc. So these are some things I think that Tishka and team would take on board. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Karita. On that note, Tana Coffee is waiting for you. <laughs>